good morning. Wonderful to see your smiling faces. Happy to see that we've made it through this troubling time, as they say in the Bible, through this hurricane. But happy to report that our building is still here. We didn't get washed away. Of course, we're going to remember and pray for those down south who were less fortunate than us. But I have to tell you, if you're hearing the sound of my voice today, you have a reason to praise the Lord. He has delivered you through the storm. And we just want to praise him because he enthrones himself in our praises. Yes. And I don't think that there's anywhere safer than the throne of God. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. So that's why we praise God in the good times, but we especially praise God in the hard times because we want him to set up his throne right there. Yes. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the praises to our God. Hallelujah. Well, why don't you go ahead and stand victorious today? Hallelujah. We're going to praise the Lord. Let this just be practice for what we get to do for the rest of eternity. Praise and worship him. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your hand of salvation that has delivered us through the storm. I thank you for every breath in our lungs, God. I thank you for the roof over our heads. And I thank you for this beautiful weather that you've delivered us into. Thank you. I just want to worship you today and lift you up. And may you enthrone yourselves in our hearts, God, and transform us by the renewing of our mind to be more like you. Yes. And we worship you and praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's praise God. Yeah. Good morning, church. You guys ready to worship the Lord this morning? And these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore. Still ye are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Amen. These are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet. At the trumpet's call. And lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion's hills, let's sing that again. Behold, behold, he comes riding on the clouds, and he's shining, shining like the sun at the trumpet's call. And lift your voice, year of jubilee. And out of Zion's hills, south, let's break it down. Sing, there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God. Come on. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet's call, and lift your voice. It's the year of jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation. And behold, behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like 
like the sun at the trumpet's call and lift your voice it's the year of jubilee out of zion's hill salvation and out of zion's hill salvation last time and out of zion's hill salvation because behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet's call lift your voice Shining. Shining like the sun at the trumpet's call. And lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. How the Zion's hill salvation. Come on, let's lift up a shout to the Lord this morning. hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well and Jesus is calling oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, it was bought. Leave behind. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. And Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Come to altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood sing oh come oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with blood of Jesus Christ yes it was bought and oh what a Savior isn't he wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen Yeah. 
altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. you Lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I Of the goodness of God. And this is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you.
Lift your hands toward heaven. Sing it again to the Lord. All my All life, life you have been faithful. faithful. All, All my life, life you have been so, so Of the goodness of God. Well, lift your hands toward heaven. <laughs> of the goodness yes, of Lord. God. Lift your hands toward heaven. If God has been good to you, if he's been faithful to you, and give him praise right now. Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We glorify your holy name. Oh, what a good, good God you are. How good you have been to us. We love you and we worship you and we praise you this morning. Lord, you've never let us down. All my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been faithful. Praise you, Lord. Sing it again. All my life you have been faithful, Jesus. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, hallelujah, I will sing of the goodness of God. Lord, we're so grateful this morning, grateful for your faithfulness. Oh, Lord, you've been so faithful, thankful for your goodness. We bless you and praise you and honor you this morning. Oh, what a good, good God you are. Hallelujah. Praise your name forever. This morning, before we conclude our time of worship, there are two things upon my heart that we as the family of God, as the body of Christ, want to embrace. First of all, after this week, how many of you are grateful, grateful, grateful to God for his goodness to our community? Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. God has been so good to us. I've lived in this community a lot of years, and time after time after time, the Lord has delivered us. He's been so gracious to us as a community, so gracious to us. And I don't want that to escape us today, that God has been so good to this community. And I want us just to make sure that we let the Lord know that we don't stand boastful today and our heart, we're in a minute, we're gonna pray for those who were affected by the hurricane. But before we do that, I just feel like I wanna express my gratitude to God that he spared this community what could have been a, 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 a horrible, horrible calamity. And so if you're here this morning and God spared your life, he spared your property, you slept in the dry last night, and you're grateful to God for bringing this community through that hurricane. Lift both hands toward heaven and just, just give our praise to him right now. Lord, we want us to stop and say thank you this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A thousand thank yous, Lord. Oh, we bless you for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness. We love you and we praise you. And we glorify you today. Thank you, Lord. You've been so faithful. Thank you for your goodness to this community. Thank you, Lord, that we're not in the hospital this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you that we slept in the dry last night. Hallelujah. We give you praise and glory and honor today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Now I think we ought to lift up a shout to the Lord. Clap your hands and give a shout of praise to God in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. And on the heels of our rejoicing and our gratitude to God for his goodness to us, our hearts go out today to uh, those who were less fortunate than we were in this community. As you know, that hurricane uh, devastated parts of our state. Uh, there are people who lost their lives. There are people who lost uh, their property. Uh, there are whole communities that were just completely devastated. And um, we want to pray for them. We want to lift them up in prayer. Uh, that's our responsibility as the body of Christ, to pray for one another. And I'm going to ask Pastor George to come and join me on the platform. Pastor, if you'll be so kind. Pastor, you've been through a few calamities in your day. You know what it is to walk through tumultuous waters. And uh, I want you to lead this congregation in prayer for all of the people who have been affected, for those who are hurting. They're still digging themselves out. There are people who are going to be hurting for a long time. Amen. And so let's agree together right now and Amen. let's pray oh, together. Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give him one more praise before oh, we Oh, Jesus, before Jesus, we pray. Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Jesus. Bless Jesus, your name. Jesus. Hallelujah. We come into your presence, oh, Lord. And, Lord, we thank you for what you've done for each and every one of us. Yes, but, Lord. Lord, our, our hearts go out to those that have lost loved ones. Oh, God. Lord, those that have lost property. Lord, those that have lost hope. I pray in the name of Jesus you would surround them with your love. Yes, Lord. Oh, God, let them feel your presence in the name of Jesus. Come down in a mighty way, oh, God. Lord, come down into that room, into that place where they may be living the Strange for them. Yes. Oh Lord. God, I pray that you would lift them up. Wrap your arms of love around them, oh God, that they know your presence. Oh, Let God. people turn to you like never before, oh yes. God. Because in you there is hope, there is life, there is help, there is peace. And we give you the praise. Lord, help this state to recover and give you the praise yes, and the Lord. glory. Yes, Let Lord. your name be praised. Let yes, your Lord. name be lifted up, yes, oh God, I pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to pray for one another. Yes. Pray one for another that you may be healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, you've healed us. Now we're praying for others. We lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's <laughs> praise him again. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> praise you, George. God bless you, Pastor. I'm there sorry. you go, buddy. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, Have no fear. You can count on God. Turn and say that to somebody. Have no fear. You can count on God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise his name forever. Well, sweetheart, I'm glad we have a church to be in today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Power. Power. Huh? Hey, how many of you just want to take a minute and thank God for electricity? Can we do that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen, all you have to do is go without it for about 24 hours and you'll be thanking God for electricity, cold water, stuff like that. I'll tell you. Hot water. Hot water. Hot, hot, hot water, water, cold water, just water, <laughs> you know. Say hot water. <laughs> well, praise the Lord forever. He brought us through another one, honey. Thank God. And we're delighted you're here today. Hey, thank you 
on the Sunday after the hurricane for being in church. We appreciate it. We're so it. glad to have you today. We do have some guests. We have the honor of meeting in the lobby. If you would fill out that guest card right in front of you and bring that to our guest desk, then we can have a gift for you. And we have some folks, I say, that have come home. I can Joyce Kepto. They joined us today because they didn't realize that we weren't having the celebration today. <laughs> but that's okay. They just have to come back. So yeah. um, we're so happy they moved across the bridge. So the bridge was open this morning. They were able to join us. So we welcome you. And do we have an announcement about the next homecoming? It's yeah, changed. Uh, of course, as you know. Before we do that, let's let the kids go. Oh, I see them yep, got a jumping lot of at children's the children's today. We have Come children's on. church <laughs> during this service, and they're, they're in there now having children's church. But well, if there going. are any children in the auditorium, we'd like to join kiddos. the kids in Yay. children's church. Woo. They can go. Give them a hand as they go. Way to go, kids. We love you. God bless you. Uh, awesome. As you know, sweetheart, today was to be the day that we were going to celebrate our 90th birthday as a church. Uh, how old were you 90 years ago, sweetheart? Mm, you're really, yeah. really impressive. <laughs> Same age I was. Not as old as you. We were a no-year-old, okay? <laughs> but uh, we were going to celebrate that today. Of course, the hurricane uh, struck, and many of the people that were going to be a part of that celebration, a uh, vital part of it, uh, some uh, actually evacuated out, and uh, others are civil workers, government workers, uh, utilities workers. And as you know, they've been on 24-hour-a-day call uh, during this, trying to get people's electricity restored, trying to uh, help people. And so they couldn't uh, participate today. And so we made the decision to postpone our celebration. And we are going to have our 90th birthday celebration on November the 6th. And so I'd like for you to write that down in your calendar. Uh, don't put it in ink, okay? Uh, I've, I've learned that. It's better just to put it in pencil and say, should the Lord will, we will do this or that. But uh, write it down, November the 6th. Uh, Mike and Joyce, please come back on November the 6th. And there'll be others here from days gone by who have moved away, who will be joining us that day. It's going to be a great celebration. It'll start off with a breakfast at 9 o'clock, and then we'll have the celebration at 1045. And then we're going to uh, sort of put a cap on our uh, festivities that day by having a picnic out at uh, Seminole, Lake Seminole Park. And so it's going to be a, an all-day event, a great event, and we want you to be sure and be a part of it. So write that down and let your friends know, let your neighbors know. We will be having it on November the 6th. Now, a, a great thing's happening this week, sweetheart. Summer's over now, and we're cranking back up our Wednesday night fellowship dinners. Every Wednesday night, I'm so happy to announce to you that uh, Sister Norma and Sister Wanda will be doing the cooking. And I mean, that's some good Southern cooking. And uh, they're going to be uh, starting this Wednesday night. Everybody's invited, all ages. Uh, I hope you'll come. I don't know how they do it. I mean, McDonald's has raised their prices. Chick-fil-A's raised their prices. Everybody's raised their prices. But these ladies are still doing that at $5.00. Uh, for that dinner. It's, it's un, I don't know how they do it. Dessert, drinks, the whole thing. But uh, we want you to come and be a part. We have great fellowship. They begin serving at 5.30 every Wednesday night. Am I telling the truth? 5.30? 5.30 every Wednesday night. And uh, we'll go right up until 6.30. 6.30, of course, is our discipleship programs for the children, the adults, uh, we're, we're in the adults right now are going through the chosen Bible study, having a great, great time. So all of that will be cranking back up on this Wednesday. And I hope you'll all be here and be a part of it. And I think the ladies are doing something this weekend. Yes, the ladies. And we do still have a couple spots. If you have found in your schedule that you would like to go, we are going to Daytona. They said it's good. Hotel's good. Everything's fine there. And we'll be leaving here Thursday. We're going to Thrive. We have information. If you want more information on that, 
I have it at the yes desk immediately following the service. And then Tuesday, we start a brand new Bible study on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. So if you're available to come to that, we welcome you to join us there. Great, great. Well, it's wonderful. Things are, are, are going along, and we want you to be a part of as much as you can. Now, it's time now, honey, for us to honor the Lord by paying our tithe and giving offerings unto him. And, you know, when you face something like we've all faced this week, it causes you to think about the goodness of God. And if you're like me, it causes you to just sort of break it down to its basic components. I'm grateful for life. I'm grateful for God's protection. I'm grateful for his provision. I'm grateful for God's goodness as he watches over all of us as a church family. And I've just found myself all week long just saying thank you to the Lord. And one way that we honor God is by paying our tithes and giving offerings unto him. And you know, this church has proven itself to be so faithful in that respect, so Generous. This is a generous people. And so all I have to say today is thank you and God bless you. And, and he's going to continue to bless you because there's a promise in the word of God. And basically what it says is the more you give, the more God will ensure that you have to give. Let me say that again. The more you give, the more God will ensure that you have to give. I don't think there's any promise there that if you give, God will give to you so you can fare sumptuously every day and, you know, get bigger houses and bigger, you know, I, I can't find that in the Bible. But here's what I know the word says. If you're faithful to give, God will ensure that you will always be a giver and not a borrower that you'll always be on the giving end, that you'll always have enough to help somebody else. That's what God promises. And so if there are any watching online and you have not yet taken the step of faith to obey the word of God and be a part of, of his generous giving people, I challenge you, now's the time. You don't know the blessings that you're missing out on and all the the good things that God wants to do. If you'll just be faithful, be generous to give. And so to all of you who are giving online, I don't see the uh, online, there it is, thank you. But uh, for those who are giving online and for those of you who are giving here today, I just want to say thank you. God bless you. He's going to bless you. We love you for your faithfulness. And I'd like to pray for you right now. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the joy we have of giving. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. And today I pray that you'll bless everybody that gives in this offering. You know, I just feel impressed to interrupt my prayer for a moment and uh, mention something because I want us to pray for the Wise family today as a congregation. And uh, I don't see Carl and Fran Oh, they are here. There they are right back there. I, I, I don't want to embarrass you, Carl, and your family, but I just feel impressed today to pray for y'all. Um, when the electricity, Carl and Fran were without electricity for several days, and when the electricity finally came back on in their house, uh, they weren't home, and it uh, sparked a fire, and their house burned. Um, was it on Friday, their house burned. And we haven't heard the final report yet, but it looks like it's going to be a total loss. And um, I know they're hurting today. And uh, just as a church family, Carl, we want to pray for you and, and your family. And I can't tell you, sweetheart, how many people have come up to me this morning. I've received texts, calls. What can we do? What, can we help? Carl and Fran, how, how can we help them? What can we do? Well, there are some things that you can do. And uh, what we've done is my son John's made a little list of ways that 
if you're interested in helping the Wise family during this time, that you might can help them. And so I just would like to invite you either to call the church or see John today or anytime, and he'll let you know how you can be a help to the Wise family. But as we conclude our prayer today, I just feel impressed to pray for them. Would you uh, pray with me, Father? First of all, we thank you that Carl and Fran and their daughters and even their little dog, no one was injured in that fire. We bless you for that. We thank you that they're alive today to be able to worship with us here in your house. We give you praise for that. But Lord, this has been devastating to them and uh, they're hurting today. And so as a church family, we just pray that you'll wrap your loving arms around Carl and Fran and their family. Let them feel the warmth of your embrace. Remind them, Lord, that they're not alone, but that you're right there with them. And they have a church family that loves them and are standing with them as they go through this. I pray that your grace will be sufficient for them to sustain them and uh, in, in everything they face as they start over and rebuild. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'll show them your goodness and your faithfulness through this valley. And they'll come out on the other side with a testimony of the goodness of God. And they'll give you praise and glory. And someday, they'll sit in front of some other little couple who's faced devastation and they'll be able to encourage them and look them in the eye and say, the Lord was with us and the Lord will be with you. And we thank you and praise you now for what you're going to do. Restore this family for your glory. Now, Lord, bless everybody that gives in this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you as you give this morning. We'll give God praise and glory in his house today for his goodness. Praise his name. Would you take your Bibles, everybody? Turn with me to the book of Leviticus today. We're going to bring to you a message that I've entitled The Feast of Atonement. You may or may not know that this coming Wednesday, uh, Jews all over the world, especially in Israel, will be celebrating uh, what they call Yom Kippur. Say that with me, Yom Kippur. It's one of the feasts of Israel. Uh, it's the most significant feast of the seven feasts of Israel, the most holy of all the convocations that God set apart for the people of Israel to celebrate because it is the day of atonement. And today we're going to talk about what that is uh, if you're a Bible student here, you understand the significance of the Day of Atonement, what it represents. You understand that it is not only uh, a, a, a wonderful, great thing historically as we remember the goodness of God and remember his, uh, how wonderful he is and how forgiving he is and how loving he is, but it also has a prophetic application that we're going to look at today. And this is true of all the feasts. Uh, the feasts of God are a grid, both historically and prophetically. And we see uh, in the, this grid, in this, the feast of God, 
God's goodness in days gone by, and that's not insignificant. We, we, we do not want to minimize the importance of remembering, of thanking God for his faithfulness and thanking God for his goodness and letting the things that he has done in yesteryear bolster our faith for what we face today. And that's one of the things that the face does. But the other part of it is the prophetic part of it. Because God shows us through the feasts his plan of salvation for mankind. And God created man to be with him. God created man to have relationship with him. That's why man was created. And you read it in the scripture. God uh, built a place called the Garden of Eden where he could fellowship with man, could walk with man, could uh, have a relationship with his creation. And that's why we were created. But because of the disobedience of God's creation, sin came into the picture and man was no longer able to have that kind of intimate, personal, face-to-face -face relationship that God desired when he created man. And so uh, man was put out of that place that God created, out of Eden. And of course, the judgment of sin was upon mankind. And that visits generation to generation until it comes right down to our generation and all of us. That's why the Bible says all, say all. All, all have sinned that come short of the glory of God because of that sin nature through the DNA of man that has been visited all the way from Adam. But God in his infinite mercy and his everlasting love had a plan. <laughs> a plan to restore us back to that place that he created man for. And that is to have a relationship with him and live with him and walk with him face to face for all of eternity. So really it's a great big circle. We're going back to Eden. We're going back to that place where God desired when he created man to live with him forever and forever. Can you say praise the Lord? And so these feasts are sort of a roadmap, if you will. Showing God's plan to bring us back to Eden. Showing God's plan to bring us back into full restoration and relationship with him forever and ever. And today we're going to look at the part that is the feast that is the feast of atonement. Leviticus chapter 23, beginning at verse 26. And would you stand with me all over the building today? As by standing, we honor the word of God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month, it is a day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. And you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that very day. And it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. And I pray this morning that you'll let this word of God come alive in this house. I pray, Lord, that you'll open up our hearts. Let us hear you clearly today. And I pray that you will not only encourage your saints, but challenge sinners. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to walk in lockstep with your Holy Spirit and what you're doing in these days as you work to restore us back to that place where we can live with you forever and ever. <laughs> and we thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. And the Lord bless you. Here the Lord says, I want you to put aside a day. It's the 10th day of Tishri which in the Jewish calendar, the month of Tishri, take the 10th day. And uh, the Hebrew calendar, uh, of course, is not our calendar. And so uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, usually falls sometime in the latter part of September, early part of October. This Wednesday will be uh, the Day of Atonement, be Yom Kippur. And Jews from all over the world will celebrate the Day of Atonement. They'll remember 
uh, what the Lord said in Levitical law about atoning for the sins of the people. And uh, I want us to talk just briefly before we get into the prophetic side of it about the historical part because if you're a Bible student, you've read this before, you've studied this before, but there may be some here and uh, you don't really understand the significance of the Day of Atonement, what it means to Christians today, uh, what it means to the nation of Israel. And so the Lord said, what I want you to do is I want you to set that day, say that day, not another day, not the month of Tishri and find one that's good for the family and do it on that day. No. He says, I want you to, that day, you make everything work around that day. <laughs> and I want you to have a day of atonement. And he gave them specific instructions, detailed instructions about what is to happen on that day of atonement. And so that they would know that he was serious he said to them in the book of Leviticus, if you do it any other way or if you veer from the way I'm telling you to observe the day of atonement, I will strike you dead where you stand. That's what God said. How many say that's pretty serious? Now, the reason why God was so specific and so detailed and so serious about the day of atonement being uh, done the right way, the way he says is because he wanted the world to know that there are not many ways to get to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven. And we're living in a day, and you've probably heard people say this. Maybe you've got friends who have said this to you. And, they say, and they'll say, oh, there are many ways to get to heaven. And, uh, you know, the Hindus have their way, and the Buddhists have their way, and the covens have their way, and, uh, you know, er, er, all these, uh, uh, they have their way, and there are many roads to heaven, many ways to get to heaven. And I'm here to declare to you upon the authority of the word of God that there are not many roads to heaven. There are not many ways to heaven. There is only one way. Say that with me. One way to get to heaven. And that is through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the only way that you can get to heaven. And so Jesus said in himself in John chapter 14, he said this, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. <laughs> he, he didn't say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm one of your choices. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man. Say no man. No man can come into the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. So there's only one way. To emphasize that, and you know that God shows us in the natural his character and who he is and the way he operates. In the Old Testament, he shows us in the natural how he operates in the spiritual in the day of grace that you and I live in right now. That's how we get to know God's nature. We read about, uh, for instance, you know how he feels about sin because of what he did in Noah's day when he flooded the whole earth, right? I mean, you get a clear picture how God feels about sin or on the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when he brought fire down out of heaven and destroyed them because of their wickedness. You get a sort of a clear picture how God feels about sin. Well, he still feels the same way. But in the Old Testament, he shows us in the natural who he is, his character, and, and the way he operates in the spiritual during the day of grace. And so here we have this day of atonement, and the Lord says to Moses, tell Aaron to do it exactly like this. And if he doesn't do it exactly like this, I'll kill him where he stands. And by the way, you read in Leviticus that two of Aaron's sons decided to do it a different way, decided to do it their own way, and God did strike them dead. And after he struck them dead, the Lord said to Aaron, don't say a word. Of, I don't want to hear a word. I don't want to hear a word. Because this has to be, I told you do it this way. It's the only way. There's only one way. And we don't have time to go over it all. But the high priest would go through an elaborate cleansing process. 
very detailed. The Lord told them what to do, where to do it, how to do it, what to wear, intricate details about every aspect of this elaborate cleansing process that the high priest would have to go through before he was uh, ready to enter into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. It represented the presence of God and the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, uh, you go through this elaborate cleansing process and then uh, he would take uh, he would take a bull and he would sacrifice that bull and, and uh, he would take the blood of that bull and uh, with fear and trembling go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of that sacrifice on the mercy seat. And that was for he and for his family for the atonement of their sins for one year. This is what God said. This will atone for your sins for one year. Say one year. And so then he would come out and go through another elaborate cleansing process. <laughs> and the Lord told him exactly how to do it. Don't have time to go through it all. By the way, every detail of it has meaning, prophetic meaning, uh, that we'll talk about on Wednesday night next year when we're uh, talking on eschatology. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, he would go through another, and then he would take two goats, and he would sacrifice one goat. And he would take the blood of that goat and go again with fear and trembling into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of that goat on the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And then he would come out from the Ark, uh, from the Holy of Holies, and he would uh, go through another cleansing process. And then he would take the other goat and he would put his hands on top of that goat. And he would, uh, as it were, transfer the sins of the people for the past year upon that goat. And that, by the way, is where we get the term scapegoat. Have you ever heard that term, scapegoat? Somebody uh, standing before the judge and they say, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. They frame me. I've become, their, I've become a scapegoat. You hear that a term. This is where it comes from. And so he lays his hands on that goat and passes all the sins for the people for the previous year upon that goat. And then another man who also goes through an elaborate cleansing process is prepared and ready to take that scapegoat and lead him outside the tabernacle or outside the temple into the wilderness where there were no people and there were no communities. And there he would leave that goat out there and come back and that is how they uh, celebrate every year on the Day of Atonement. And the Lord said, do it just like this. Follow every instruction. It's very important. There's only one way to do this. There are not many ways. Can't cut any corners. You got to do exactly like this every time. And for thousands of years, they did that. First in the tabernacle, then in the temple until the destruction of Israel that was prophesied in the Old Testament would take place. And they haven't been able to do that from that day unto this. However, uh, well, we'll talk about that later. But there were two goats. Say two goats. One goat was sacrificed. One goat was the scapegoat. It was taken out into the wilderness, and the sins were gone out there. Nobody could see them. Nobody could uh, uh, bring them up. It was just gone forever out there. There were no people out there. And what that points to is the full atonement package, which is two parts. First of all, the propitiation. Uh, propitiation. Say that with me. Propitiation. The Bible says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That's an act of appeasing the wrath of God. God had declared the soul that sins shall surely die. And the propitiation means that we've appeased the wrath of God for our sins for one year. And that is the goat that was sacrificed. The goat that was sacrificed represents the fact that uh, God's wrath for the sins of that year has been settled for one year now. And then there's another word called expiation. Say that with me. Expiation. And that is the act of removing sin from the sinner. And that's the scapegoat. The priest would lay his hand. The sins of the people would come upon the scapegoat. They'd take it out in the wilderness, and it was gone, okay? No people out there, no communities out there. It was gone forever. 
And that explains uh, what the Day of Atonement did. Now, it covered Israel for one year, but I'm happy to announce to you that in due season, God himself came in the form of a man. His name was Jesus Christ, and he became the propitiation for our sins, and he became the expiation for our sins. Uh, and Jesus Christ shed his blood once and for all uh, and took it and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat in heaven, uh, and once and for all, we don't have to do this every year. It's not covering our sins just for one year. It's not doing away of our sins for one year. It's forever and ever and ever. When Jesus shed his blood, our sins were covered forever. Can you say amen? amen. And so we don't have to do that anymore. That's why we don't, uh, on the day of atonement, we don't do the sacrifices anymore because Christ covered it once and forever. He was the propitiation, the act of appeasing God's wrath. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. Say his blood. Not the blood of a bull, not the blood of a goat, by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And so when Jesus shed his blood, we're saved from the wrath of God. And He's the propitiation for our sins, but he's also the expiation of our sins, the act of removing it from the sinner. And here's what I love about my salvation, <laughs> and you ought to love it about your salvation. Not only do we have atonement, not only is our sins covered, not only is our sins forgiven. How many of you are glad that when you invite Jesus into your heart, he forgives your sins? How many of you are glad for that? I'm grateful for that. That's the first goat. But there's another goat, <laughs> and that's the scapegoat. Not only does he forgive my sins, he also, as an act of his will, chooses to forget my sins. And only God can do that. Only God can do that. God, because he is God, and because he is sovereign, has the ability to will something into existence. The Bible says when there was nothing, a great void, a vacuum of anything, no atoms, no electrons, no protons, no neutrons, no nothing, no specks, when there was nothing, the Bible says that God willed the worlds into existence. By his will, he spoke them into existence. And because he willed it to happen, everything that we see happened because God willed it into existence. And the Bible says that God has willed to forget your sins. <laughs> oh, that ought to make somebody happy here today. He willed to forget your sins. You can't do that. You can't just as an act of your will, just forget something. You still remember it. You can't, you do, you wished you did, you could, you could, but you can't. Things that happen, you still remember it. Now, I said that in the first service and Randy up in the booth up there, uh, running our television, uh, uh, thing up there. He come to me and said, Pastor, you misspoke in the first service. I said, I, I did. I said, what did I say? He says that men can't forget. He said, let me tell you something. The older I get, the more I forget. He says, he said, I, I, sometimes I can't even remember my own name. I said, okay, you're right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we can forget things, but not just as an act of your will. You know what I'm saying? You can't just forget, but you're not God and you're not sovereign. <laughs> but God who is sovereign has the ability, if he chooses to, to remember your sins no more. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will. Say, I will. I will remember their sins no more. Now, that's why it's foolish of us to allow the devil to bring our sins back up and throw them in our face and condemn us because of things we've done in days gone by and things we've participated in in days gone by. And the Lord will uh, maybe call you to do something for him. And the devil will come along and say, you can't do that. Don't you know the bad things you've done? Don't you know the people you've hurt? Don't you know the horrible things you've done? How dare you think you can do something for God? Don't you know how bad you've been? And if we're not careful, we'll listen to him 
and we'll back up from what God has called us to do. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, that's a lie from the pit of hell. How many of you know the devil is not only a liar, he's the father of all lies? And that's a lie from the pits of hell. Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might have life. And so here the Bible says, God has willed it. He said, I will to remember your sins no more. And so if you've come to Jesus and you've invited Christ into your life and you've had the blood of Christ applied to your life, don't go back to God talking about the sins of yesteryear because he might look at you and say, what in the world are you talking about? You did what? You said what? <laughs> I mean, why would you? Uh, he's forgotten him. Why would you want to remind him of it? He remembers them against you no more. So we do not walk in condemnation from yesteryear. We walk in freedom. Why? Because there were two goats. The first goat, the propitiation for our sins. That means our sins are forgiven. The second goat, the expiation of our sins, the scapegoat. That means our sins are taken away from us and he remembers them against us no more. Now would be a good place for us to clap our hands and give God praise for his goodness in our lives. And so Hebrews chapter seven, verse 27, he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once and for all. Say that with me. Once and for all when he offered up himself. Hallelujah. And that's what the Day of Atonement, that's why we celebrate the Day of Atonement. We remember. It's historical. I mean, it has great meaning. It has great impact. We can rejoice. He is the propitiation of our sin. He is the expiation of our sin. Hallelujah. And we rejoice in that respect. But there's also a prophetic application because every time the Jews would celebrate the Day of Atonement every time the priest would go through the elaborate cleansing processes and every time they would offer those sacrifices and sprinkle that blood upon the mercy seat. Every time they did that, it was a foreshadowing. Say that with me, foreshadowing. It was pointing to the future, towards something. And we know now that, of course, it was pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ would finally be the one sacrifice once and for all, and we praise the Lord for that. But when you look at the seven feasts, you know that they are a prophetic grid, a historical grid, yes, but also a prophetic grid that we can see the handiwork of God and the plan of God for our restoration unto him. The first feast, Passover, the death of Christ happened at Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, prophetic toward the burial of Christ, the Feast of First Fruits, prophetic toward the resurrection of Christ, those are called the early feasts. They all happen in the springtime, all right together, and we call those the early feasts. Then there's the middle feast, which is the Feast of Weeks. Uh, we call it the Feast of Pentecost. That sort of happens 50 days after the, uh, the uh, uh, Feast of First Fruits. Happens in the summertime. And all that, of course, is prophetic toward the birth of the church. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, the church was born. Amen? And the church that you and I are part of was birthed in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Then we have the latter feast. Say that with me. Latter feast. These happen in the latter part of the year. So they're, they're all kind of clumped together in the fall time of the year. And that's where we're at now. And prophetically, they all happen in the latter days, all right? And that's where we are now in the latter days. Last week, we talked to you about the first of the latter feast, and that is the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah. And we know that that's prophetic toward the catching away of the saints. It's the next thing to happen. Nothing has to happen. There are no other prophecies that need to be fulfilled before Jesus catches away his church. Some people call it the rapture of the church. The Bible talks of, it, talks of it as a catching away. 
where we go to meet the Lord in the air. And we preached on that last week. If you weren't here, it would profit you to go on our website and listen to that teaching because it's the next thing to happen. And so we have our eyes cast upon the eastern sky, our ears are attuned for the trumpet of God, and we're waiting on the Lord to call us up out of here. And then we'll start the end of times. And so Jesus said that just before that, there would be a beginning of sorrows like a woman in the last stages of labor where there'll be great pain upon the earth, wars, rumors of wars, he mentioned earthquakes, calamities, famines. We're seeing that happening all around us right now. There's never been more saber rattling in my lifetime as is going on right now in the world. And they're talking about using nuclear weapons and they're talking about fighting and there are alliances that are taking place. And all of this, of course, Jesus foresaw and told us was going to happen. He said, just before the catching away, this is what will be happening. And we see it happening all around us. There's nothing left to be done. No other prophecies need to be fulfilled. Jesus is ready to come back. And that is Rosh Hashanah. But after Jesus comes back, then the next feast is Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement. And that is prophetic toward the work of Christ applied to Israel. The work of Christ applied to Israel. Now I want to show you this in the scripture. Because the Bible prophesies that in the last days, right at the end, Israel, as a people, as a race, as a nation, would come to Christ. After they had been scattered to the four corners of the earth and after they had been deceived for a season, then they will come uh, back to Christ, and I want to show you that in the Scripture right now. And then, of course, the last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's prophetic toward the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. Can you say amen? amen. Now, Yom Kippur, the application of the work of Christ to Israel. Everybody turn to Luke chapter 21. I want to show you something here. This is a prophecy that our Lord himself, Jesus, gave. And uh, you can read it again in the book of Mark and in Matthew, but I'm going to use uh, Luke's rendering here of this prophecy that he gave uh, concerning Israel. Are you ready? Luke chapter 21. I'm going to begin reading at verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies... Then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out of the country enter in. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Look at me. Jesus is saying when you see this happening, it, it, you're going to see the destruction of Israel and all that the prophets had prophesied before in Ezekiel and in Isaiah and in Daniel, uh, that they said, was them, this is it. This is what they said is happening. You'll know that it's happening when you see armies surrounding Israel. All right. And then he goes on to say this in verse 24, they will fall by the edge of the sword talking about Israel now. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. Say all nations. All over the world. They will be led captive among all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Until. Say until. And we're going to stop right there for a minute. Okay. So here Jesus says, when you see armies surrounding, he's prophesying, he's standing, he's looking over Jerusalem, he's prophesying the future, and he's saying, when you, he was talking to the people, when you see armies surrounding this city of Jerusalem, you will know that God is getting ready to, uh, to do away with the nation of Israel and that they will be led captive into all nations, all over the world, the four corners of the world. That happened in 70 A.D. The Roman general Titus 
led legions of Roman soldiers from the north. And they came through the land of Israel, conquering city after city until finally they found themselves in Jerusalem and they surrounded Jerusalem and laid siege upon the city. This is in 70 AD. Titus, incidentally, later became emperor of Rome, much because of this great victory he had in the land of God, in the land of Israel. And so Titus had his soldiers build encampments all around Jerusalem. And they put soldiers there and they laid siege on the city. No food could come in, no water could come in, nobody could come out. It became so bad that people were dying so quickly they could not bury them. They were piling them up in great heaps upon the streets of Jerusalem. The smell from those dead bodies was so bad that Josephus reports that when the wind was a certain way, the Roman soldiers on the ramparts could not stay there. The smell was so bad, they'd have to abandon the ramparts and leave that part when the wind would come that way. The people resorted to cannibalism. Some people ate their own children. They ate coins. They ate wood. They ate leather. And a great siege upon Jerusalem. And finally, the zealots either all died or were willing to surrender. And Titus was so enraged at the rebellion that he ordered the city of Jerusalem to be completely destroyed. He said, I don't want one stone left upon another. You Bible students, does that remind you of anything? What did Jesus prophesy? <laughs> there would be not one stone left upon another. Titus said, I don't want one stone left upon another. And they went in there and they took the largest edifice in the world, the temple of Jerusalem. And they took great Roman battering rams and they lit the place on fire and they battered those stones, those huge stones uh, out of their uh, place. And they crushed those stones down to gravel until finally Josephus standing on Mount Scopus above Jerusalem looked down and he said, I could not tell whether the temple used to be over here or used to be over here. It was just one big gravel pit, the whole thing. 70 AD. Jesus said, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, you will know that it'll be the destruction of the nation. They'll be led captive all over the world. They were. The city of Jerusalem has been rebuilt, but from 70 AD... It was not a city of the Jews. The Gentiles were there. The Marmalukes, the Turks, the Muslims, the British, you know, uh, uh, the Crusaders. I mean, it was, it was, it was all a Gentile uh, city. And that's what Jesus said here. He said, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by who? The Gentiles. Until, say until. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now that's an important thing Jesus said there. Jesus prophesied this. He said, when you see the army surrounding, that happened in 70 AD, they'll be led captive, the city will be destroyed, the Gentiles will trample all over it, which they did for 2,000 years until 1948, when by a miracle of God, the children of Israel started coming from all over the world and established a nation again. And today, there is a sovereign nation of Israel where the Jews are there worshiping Jehovah because Jesus said this will take place until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That happened in 1948. This would be another place to give God praise and glory for his goodness. Praise his name. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Notice at verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening. Now I want you to look at that. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. Say partial. That's not total, right? That's partial. And that's where the Jews have been for the last 2,000 years. Not all of them. I thank God for our Messianic Jew brother and sisters. They're a part of our family. They're a part of us. They are who we are. We are who they are. And uh, there, there are many Messianic Jews uh, all over the world, all over this country, all over this city. And we thank God for that. But as a whole, the people of Israel, as a whole, the nation, 
uh, here the scripture says that there will be a partial hardening. In other words, the Jews still recognize Jehovah as God. They're not atheists. They still fear God, but they do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. How many of you believe that's a pretty important part? Because he's the only way. <laughs> There's only one way. <laughs> and they do not recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So here the Bible says, listen to this now, that there is a partial hardening has come upon Israel until, say until, the fullness of the Gentiles has come. There it is again. <laughs> Same thing Jesus said. A partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Well, that came in 1948, right? How many of you know there is a nation of Israel today? They've come from the four corners of the world. God's brought them back, but they still lack one thing. They're still in this partial hardening. They don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And this is the way all Israel will be saved. Say all Israel. Now, this is the importance of Yom Kippur. This is Israel being restored to the blood of Jesus Christ as his prophesied. Are you ready? And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so there's going to come a time when all of Israel, they'll finally put the dots together. I mean, they've got it all right, but they just hadn't got the most important thing right. But they'll finally put the dots together and they'll say, oh, I see it now. Of course, when Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, that was all about Jesus. And every year when the priest would sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat, that was all about Jesus. And the prophets prophesying, it was all about, of course, I can't believe I didn't see it, but I see it now. I see it now. And they will be restored as a nation back into the body of Christ. Can you say praise the Lord? That's Yom Kippur. That, that's the prophetic significance of the Feast of Atonement. It's going to happen. The Bible says here, it's going to happen. I want to read you one more scripture. My time's gone. I know it. This has been heavy today. I've given you a lot. Most of you are still with me. Thank you for that. <laughs> I love you for it. <laughs> but I want to read one more scripture. Because many of us think that this final restoration, this, this final thing where the Jews will finally recognize and, and the blood of Christ will be applied to the nation of Israel will happen in the great tribulation period. Because it can't happen before Rosh Hashanah, right? In other words, the feast have to happen just like in sequence as they have so far. The next thing to happen is the catching away. So Israel cannot be restored until the catching away. Rosh Hashanah comes before Yom Kippur. This is important. First will be the catching away, but then after that, the Bible says there'll be great tribulation on the earth. And we have a little glimpse into that in Revelation chapter 7. I want to read it to you. Revelation chapter 7. John is seeing his vision of the great tribulation period, the great tribulation time on earth, which happens after the catching away. Are you ready? Here's what he saw. Then I, John, saw another angel with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000. Say that with me. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. These are all Jews, 100% of them. 144,000 sealed from the tribes of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from every tribe. Verse 9. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude. Say great multitude. <laughs> and no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb of God. Can you say praise the Lord? In that tribulation period, there's going to be a great harvest. It'll be led by 144,000 Jewish 
12,000 from every tribe, Jewish people, who will span this globe and preach Christ crucified. People will have to give their lives in martyrdom if they accept Christ in those days. It's going to be horrible. But the prophecy that Jesus gave will be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles are over. They have their nation back now. The people have come back from the four corners of the world. And the only thing left is for the blood of Jesus Christ to be applied to the nation of Israel. And it is going to happen. Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement. Can you say amen? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you for your word. <laughs> oh, I, Lord, I'm so excited today. It just, it just gets my spirit excited when I see what you're doing. When I see this prophetic grid through the feast and I know that you could come back at any moment. And someday, even the Jews will come back to you and recognize you as Messiah. And we look toward that day. And like John of old, we cry out, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The heads bowed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know much about the Jews and the Jewish nation, but I know one thing, I need forgiveness in my life. If that's you, friend, it's no accident that you're watching this broadcast or that you're here in this sanctuary today. God has orchestrated this because he loves you. And if you will only ask him right now, he will forgive your sins and remember them against you no more. You say, I don't know how to do that. Well, you can't do it wrong. All you have to do is whisper a prayer. Just say it to him. Just like you would talk to anybody else. Just say it to the Lord. As a matter of fact, you can do it right now. Heads are bowed in this room. If you need forgiveness or if you're watching online, just say, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me right now. I need forgiveness of my sins. I'm sorry that I've sinned. And I invite you into my life. I, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. I, I want to be one of your children. And, and I invite you to come in to my life right now. I surrender myself to you. Just whisper that to the Lord. He's listening to you right now. Now say, thank you, Lord. I, I believe, I believe, I believe that you've forgiven my sins and I thank you for it. As a matter of fact, everybody in this room that's had your sins forgiven and you know it, clap your hands and give God praise for it right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Congregation, would you stand to your feet? Everyone standing. I want all of my prayer counselors quickly, quickly, as quickly as you can come and prepare to serve this beautiful congregation of people. We're going to end this service with a great altar call. If there's something going on in your life and you need prayer, it'll be our joy to pray for you, to pray with you, or if you just want to spend some time around these altars praying, uh, come on down and you can pray here for as long as you'd like. But for the rest of us, I want us to walk out of here Wednesday. Wednesday's Yom Kippur. On Wednesday, I just want us to think about it for a moment. Think about the blood atonement. He's forgiven us and he remembers our sins against us no more. Amen? And then cast your sight toward the eastern sky and say, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And let's remember and let's look forward on Yom Kippur of this year. Praise the Lord. Well, how many of you are glad you came to church today? <laughs> Isn't this wonderful to be in God's house? Praise his name forever. I'm going to ask my son Jonathan to please come. John, I've sensed God's presence from the very beginning here today. I want you to come up here and pray a great prayer of dismissal. And as soon as he says amen, you'll be dismissed for today. Otherwise, if you want prayer, you can come on down here and pray. But before we do that, I'd like to speak a blessing over you and your family. If you'd like to express faith to receive this blessing, lift both hands up high above your head right now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord place his name upon you. The Lord bless your life. If you receive that, clap your hands and thank God for it right now in Jesus' name.